Okay. Did you want to say it? Yeah, I think I can hear my own voice on this. So that's pretty sensitive. All right. And also, not to be rude, but just to warn you, I have to leave at 8. Well, that's fine. I think actually the interview won't be more than like 20, 25 minutes or so. I don't know. I'm very mouthy. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah. we may have to edit you down. <laughs> Is it can you move you over there because I can't YouTube. really so, see you. Oh, yeah. I mean, they can go long, but tend to want to keep those a bit short. No, but to say, you know, say whatever you feel like saying. Well, you can no, edit out. No, 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 actually, I have one after it. Yeah, here. Okay. Sure I may show this or something. Okay. So you, you've you seen some of the notes yeah. for, for the questions, okay. All right, so uh, we are here today at McGill University uh, for a very special interview with uh, Professor Paul Nathanson, uh, who's in the Religious Studies Department, and we're in the very, very beautiful, I guess, Religious Studies headquarters here at McGill. Um, today we're going to be talking a bit about a, con a concept known as misandry, which actually I don't believe is, is yet to be found in the Microsoft Word Dictionary. It always highlights it as though it's an unknown mm -hmm. word, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, and we'll get into what misinjury is. You've written a trio of books, and there's more to come, and they're right there on the table. But why don't we start there, if, if, we, if we may, uh, Dr. Nathanson. What, uh, what is misinjury? How do, you, how do you define it? Well, first of all, I invented the word, except that I discovered later that somebody else or many people have invented it. Um, <clears throat> also, I, I, some, I usually pronounce it misandry because I want to make, you know, it is the counterpart of misogyny. Mm -hmm the sexist counterpart of misogyny. Um, I say misandry because I want to I emphasize that part of the word so that it's clear. Um, when I looked, uh, you know, Library of Congress has, um, in their subject uh, headings, they have, um, oh, they had about a few dozen books with the subject heading misandry. And of course they had, I couldn't count the number of they had under misogyny. Um, so the word is there. It was uh, not, was, hardly anybody knew what it was, which is why I had to invent it. Um, however, I find that now it's all over the internet. So people are using the word now. And I do find, I guess, because it's a, a newer word, perhaps the, the definition hasn't really been well defined because I've seen it in some dictionaries as hate of men, in others as contempt. Mm -hmm. uh, in some, it's more of a mm -hmm. of a dislike rather than than, mm -hmm. than, a, than a strong hate. Mm -hmm. uh, to you, is it kind of all of those things, or any or just one? I of those would things? say that it would be anything that is included in the word misogyny, mm. which would range. Yes, I mean it includes everything from casual contempt to hatred. Mm -hmm. Can you give me some examples of my, maybe what, what would span that range? Like what, what would be um, sort of like the, the, lo the lower level, maybe more trivial to, to what, using prevalent examples all the way up to something that's quite hateful? Well, I mean, you know, there are all these jokes, uh, comic books, you find it, uh, it, it's pervasive in popular culture at that level. And um, people tend to overlook it because they say, well, you know, it's funny and everybody has a sense of humor and, you know, why get excited about it? Um, and if it were only that, maybe I wouldn't get excited about it. But it, it's, uh, that's only the surface level, that's only the most obvious. Um, at its worst, it comes out in um, people like Andrea Dworkin or... Uh, Oh, what's the name of that woman who uh, wrote the Scum Manifesto? Valerie mm -hmm. Solanas. Uh, I mean, um, you know, and you talk about extermination, or you know, that's the that's the more obviously the more serious level. Yeah, hard to get more serious um, than that, I guess. Pretty hard. Yeah, and and these people were serious. These mm -hmm. were they were not joking around. Um, now, that's not to say that. That level of misandry is pervasive. I don't know that it is. I don't think that most women are haters. But it is in the culture. 
And um, it's become institutionalized in various ways through law, journalism, popular culture, high culture, academic work. Uh, it is pervasive, and that's why we really need to monitor it. We had an event last night, and we, uh, we had Barbara Kay, the National Post columnist, talking about mis mis uh, sorry, misandry, I'll, I'll adopt your pronunciation, um, the contempt of men, and in particular in the family court system, oh, yeah. uh, which, which you know all about. Um, my question is this, we had a, a row of individuals who were sort of disruptive and they were tweeting away and they were actually using hashtag uh, anti-femme party, mm -hmm. which was kind of ironic when you think about it. Um, but in any case, one of the tweets that they put was that uh, to them mis misandry and, mis and misogyny were just opposite sides of the same coin. And you just earlier said yes. that they should be similarly defined. Do you, do you think yeah, that, they that are. one is kind of the flip side of the yes, other? Yes, I do. I do. Okay. They're just two variants of sexism. I see no difference between these phenomena. Professor Nathanson, why did you get into this? You're in religious studies. Was there a, a way into gender through that, or was it just a, another issue that independently interested you? Well, I, you know, as I, it, this is a long story, and it goes back to my childhood. Uh, I'm gay. Of course, I didn't know that for many, many years, but I certainly got a lot of bullying as a child. And so I, uh, it was a question to me, what does it mean to be a man? I had no idea. Um, uh, my father is a very, was, he died a few years ago, but he was a very engagé parent. He certainly wasn't, you know, indifferent or absent or anything like that. Um, but I didn't particularly think that I was like him. As it turned out, of course, I am like him. I think we all turn into our parents sooner or later. Um, whether but we like it or not. <laughs> whether we like it or not. Um, in his case, I think I'm, I'm, uh, uh, it's a good thing because I, in some ways he was a better man than I will ever be. Mm. But, um, but I didn't know what it meant. And, you know, I, my reason for being a little bit alienated from him was because uh, he worked very hard. Um, he didn't particularly enjoy what he did. He was an engineer and he built houses, um, but uh, he really wanted to be a researcher. And uh, he wasn't good with business and work for him was a, uh, an alienating thing. And I, I could see that he wasn't terribly happy at that. So he wasn't somebody that I would look to as a model of, you know, how to be happy as an adult. Um, Anyway, um, so I had all these questions in my mind. I didn't know what to do with any of it. Then uh, the next stage, I guess, was um, uh, I went to Columbia in New York, and that was, this is how old I am, I'm ancient, before you guys were even born, but this was the height of the Vietnam War. And... Uh, Although I was a Canadian citizen, I had been born in New York. Um, and there was certainly a possibility of being drafted. And uh, so I was surrounded by all this, this the protest movements, and you know, it was a very, very polarized atmosphere on the campus. And everybody was talking about the war, everybody was talking about the draft, but not from the point of view that interested me. They were talking about the war. It was all about hawks and doves and, and you know, and just military industrial complexes and Geneva Accords, uh, none of which interested me. What interested me was what did that war, what did war have to do with manhood? Mm -hmm. Why, what did it have to do with me? And um, nobody was talking about that. Absolutely nobody. Interesting. So I found the atmosphere there very threatening and I just, I packed up and came home. And I put it on on the back burner for about 10 years. And then on the 10th anniversary of the end of Vietnam, there was all this, uh, all this programming on, you know, Good Morning America and Today Show. It was, all, it was everywhere. The 10th anniversary, what did it all mean? You know, we lost 60,000 men. What did it mean? And by that time, I was ready to deal with it. I had the intellectual and emotional resources, and I said, okay, I'm going to deal with this. And this was in the middle of my doctoral dissertation, and um, I just took off about a month. Uh, I didn't intend to, but it, it amounted to that. And I just sat in, and I wrote in my journal 
I reconstructed my, from memories and from memorabilia, my experience in New York. I wrote about what I had felt then, what I had, was feeling later. Uh, but more of it was not feelings, it was about thoughts. And I, I, I read, I read a lot. There were a lot of memoirs that had come out of the war. I read them all. Um, so I got about 300 pages in my journal, and I had only about 40 pages in my dissertation, and Catherine says, hey, what's going on here? Um, so I, I, I explained to her what I was doing, and she said, well, you know, that's really interesting. I gave her some of my stuff to read. And she said, well, that's really interesting, because I spent all these years working on mainly on, well, her field is, is India, but she had done most of her work on women in India. And she thought, you know, we ought to, you know, we ought to make it, get a research grant. Because when you graduate, we'll get a research grant. You have to have your priorities. That's right. <laughs> um, and that's what happened. And so I graduated about a year or two later, and we got a, I got a postdoctoral fellowship, and we started to work on that. And then we got another grant. Um, this was at the Center for Medicine, Ethics, Ethics and Law. And we got a grant from their family research project. And we looked at new reproductive technologies. But we looked at it from the point of view of men, which nobody had done. Nobody had done that. It just didn't occur to anybody that men or fathers or men would have any stake at all in what was going on with reproductive technologies. Uh, there was a there was a royal commission on this, and uh, once again, it occurred to no one, absolutely no one, that men might have a stake. And not only men, of course, but but indirectly society as a whole. I mean, if you say to men, "You have nothing to do with reproduction. This is women's stuff," then what are the implications? The implications are well, why should men stick around in families at all? Exactly. Why not just a bad? What's the point? And of course, that message is very resolutely um, reinforced uh, with divorce and custody laws and, and all this kind of thing. And then with single motherhood by choice. And then with gay marriage. And my problem with gay marriage is, has nothing to do with homosexuality. It has to do with if you have two women who think it's okay to have a child without a father, I have a problem with that. And similarly, two men who have a child without a mother. So that brings up the question of, is, do we need fathers? Because nobody questions whether we need mothers. Do we need fathers? Is there a distinctive role for fathers? That question is still being asked. We need to answer that. We need to have research on that. So at this point, you've, you've decided that you're going to embark into this new territory. Right. And you have a, a willing ally in, in Catherine right. Young, right. who was your dissertation That's right. uh, thesis advisor, and now your partner's in this. Right. And would you say that you, you have different styles? How does, that, how does that relationship work when you yes. write your books together? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, yeah, we do have different styles. Uh, she, it, her personality is entirely different. Uh, she's, a, she's a real fighter. She's, she likes to fight. She likes to argue. She likes conflict. She goes in there with both fists. I I'm, I'm, couldn't be less like that. <laughs> um, she has a, her specialty is in Asian studies. Mine is in Western. She does, has a long history of research on women. I have specialized more in men. Uh, she does elite culture in the sense that she takes uh, texts, Indian texts that were written by philosophers and you know for the elite level of society. The others were illiterate, so they were the ones who wrote all the, the philosophical works. I tend to be interested in popular culture. So, in all these ways, we've combined forces and it's been really good. But the... So, oh, no, please finish your thought. The ultimate thing that we are doing, however, and the best part about our partnership is that our ultimate goal is what we call intersexual dialogue. And that is, we want um, a structured way in which men and women, not necessarily individuals, but groups, uh, can talk to each other in the same way as interreligious dialogue. And I have had experience in, in that. Um, however, I would have to say that interreligious dialogue tends to be, it's become a cliche. And it's, at one level, it's all about, you know, people getting together in church basements and talking about how much they have in common and everything is very nice. At another level, it's about organizational structures and cooperation. 
we want, I want something more rigorous and something more, um, uh, I want to reach a depth dimension. Yeah, a little more productive than um, you we're, I'm not interested in organizations, I'm not interested in polite chit chat, I want men and women to talk to each other with mutual respect. Now, so in the final volume of our, of our series on misandry called Transcending Misandry, it culminates in this notion of intersexual dialogue, and we've produced uh, using as a, I wouldn't say a gimmick, but almost a gimmick, we looked at the Ten Commandments and we said, well, can we come up with ten principles that would guide men and women talking to each other? So we came up with what we call the Decalogue of Dialogue. And these principles, though, these are serious principles, and they're and you have to take them seriously, and they're they're not easy. They involve things such as um, not assuming that you know anything about the other. Just listen. Be able to listen to the other. Um, so uh, anyway, there are those ten principles. So we have a structure. We would like to see this kind of thing implemented. Um, even institutionalized in public schools, in churches, in civic organizations, um, and not necessarily confined to men and women. It could be for any groups in conflict. Let's come back to this yeah. um, okay. towards the end, because what, what, you're, what you're getting at, and I know you have a book coming out with under that title, is sort of the solutions to some of the problems. Let's first sort of present what not the Not solutions. Well, it's a, it's a to, roadway yeah. that could produce a solution. We don't have the solution. We'd have the yeah. Nobel Prize if we had that. Yeah, well, you have, maybe you have a method or a dialogue for getting there. Um, but I think a lot of people would, would, uh, would wonder, you know, what, well, what's the big deal? You know, what, what, what is it that's, that, that needs to be solved or that we need to create a roadmap towards potentially solving? And I guess towards that end, you've sort of set that ground up with your first three books, uh, right. Spreading Misinjury, which touches on popular culture. Uh, mostly legalizing misinjury, both the, the legal system and sanctifying misinjury, which I guess is where you bring in some of that religious ba yeah. background that you have. So I'd like to I'd like to go through these in, yeah. in, in, a, in a bit of detail because they're all fascinating and they all take on a, a quite a large chunk of, of the pie. Um, let me start with with spreading misinjury, the teaching of contempt for men in popular culture. There is an event going on right now at the University of Toronto, where I hail from, and I think it's at a number of other campuses called misrepresentation. I think you're familiar with it from the head shake. Um, the idea is that women are misrepresented in the media and this has ne rather negative consequences. Um, is, is your claim that something like that is going on with Oh, men? definitely. Now, um, we, uh, I, a few weeks ago I looked down the Alumni Association had produces various events and so I was looking down the list of the events and sure enough they had um, a lecture, I think it was somebody in your department who's giving a lecture on misrepresentation of women. And, <clears throat> you know, it occurred to me that after 25 years of research here at McGill, nobody thought to ask us to give a similar talk or even to join in that. Or it, there was just completely, we were just not part of the scene. And that really bothered me. Um, I wrote to the Alumni Association. Uh, a nice letter, I mean, not a nasty letter, but I said, look, uh, you know, what, what's going on here? And uh, I got a letter back and I was told, well, I'm, you're, you know, it's not us, it's you talk to the person who's in charge of that department. And I did, uh, I wrote a letter and never got a, a response to that. Um, anyway, to get back to your point, uh, the misrepresentation of men is not only pervasive, but, and I think that the misrepresentation of women, uh, it certainly exists, I don't think it's nearly as pervasive as it once was, and one reason for that is that it's very, very closely monitored. Mm -hmm. You know, you put on a show or a commercial on TV that has the slightest hint of something that women don't like, you will hear about that the next day. There will be heads rolling. Now, when that happens uh, in the reverse, when men are misrepresented, nothing happens. Now, when you describe men as misrepresented, I really want to be clear on this. Are you talking about a few, you know, jokes here and there, like The Simpsons? Yeah, it has a pretty bad portrayal of, of the mm -hmm. father figure. You, you're, but my understanding is you're saying this is this is a pattern. This is a ser this is a serious 
um, the serious pattern that you could actually yeah. that you could actually point to. At, how do we, at what point do we say you know enough is enough? It's not just isolated. There is a pattern, and we have to deal with it. Well, you know, I, the only way to do that really is just to collect enough data and present it. Um, so we had uh, spreading misandry originated as the introductory chapter to a one volume work on this topic. So it's turned into five volumes, and that is a separate volume now. Well, we went through. Uh, we went through comic strips, uh, harlequin romances, soap operas, sitcoms, commercials. Uh, the, only, the only medium, the only genre that we didn't do, actually, and we should have, was popular music. And greeting cards, too. And greeting cards, yeah. that's right. That was particularly interesting. So, um, not only that, so we, did, we, we cast a very wide net. Um, we took uh, as our case study period 20 years, from 1980 until the turn of the century. Um, then we arranged the book in, in order of gravity. So the first chapter, I can't remember all the titles now, the first chapter is called, I don't know, Ridiculing Men or something. So we had all the jokes. Then, here, let me just yes, go through this. Uh, Okay, the first chapter is called The Last of Vaudeville, Laughing at Men. Um, then we have Looking Down on Men, Separate but Unequal. Bypassing Men, Women Alone Together. Blaming Men, A History of Their Own. Uh, dehumanizing Men, From Bad Boys to Beasts. And then finally, Demonizing Men, The Devil is a Man. So mm. these are themes that run through popular culture but we arrange them in increasing order of gravity. So by the time you get to, to dehumanizing and demonizing men, it's a pretty ugly picture. I, I think that's where you, you discuss, and, and I'd like you to maybe provide us with some evidence uh, to justify this, that when men are portrayed in popular culture, like primarily, you, I think you're talking here about movies, they are either evil or incompetent. That is the, the stereotype of, of, of a male yeah, figure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or there's one other, there is one other alternative, <clears throat> uh, and that is, uh, well, it could be one of two things. It could be um, what we call honorary women, which is to say men who have adopted feminism in one form or another, and so their portrayal is, is good because they're the good guys, but they also tend to be in the background and they don't tend to be very effective. But in any case, that's one portrayal of men. Mm -hmm. And the other one, the other exception would be, I guess, um, men of various ethnic or racial groups, and they're sort of given a free pass because they're, <clears throat> they're ethnic. Um, so, but they're also, <clears throat> they tend to be minor characters. I'm sure while you were doing your research, your blood must have been boiling a lot at, at all these different examples. But I'm, I'm really wondering, this is kind of a sensational question, were there any particular examples, whether it's a movie or an image on a, on a greeting card or something that really, you know, you felt like, I'm a scholar, but I really want to, you know, become an activist and write in and, and or boycott this particular <laughs> film or whatever it is. Anything that, that stands out? Well, it's hard to say. I, I mean, um, as far as movies go, the one, the one that, that made me most angry because of its very sophisticated structure was a movie called Sleeping with the Enemy mm -hmm. with Julia Roberts. Right. Now that was, a, that was a, a very high production value movie, lots of money went into it, there's Julia Roberts, and it was very well produced, very sophisticated, very convincing, and uh, the title really says it all. Uh, the title, you know, in, this, in the movie it refers to a woman who is married to and therefore sleeps with um, a, a killer. Um, but of course, uh, if you, by implication, the implication is that any woman who is married and sleeps with a man is sleeping with the enemy. <clears throat> and that, of course, is a theme that comes out very strongly in some of the lesbian literature. Um, so, not all of it, but some of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so I was really amazed at this movie, and the imagery was very clever. I mean, the man, you know, the whole movie is structured around two, <laughs> around two sets. One set 
is in the beach house where this couple lives at first. Mm -hmm. And the beach house, <clears throat> the design of the house, the architecture is very modern, but very modern in a sterile way. Uh, cold, sterile, machine-like. The husband works out on his machine all the time. Um, so the, all the imagery is of um, uh, metal, steel, glass, concrete, machinery, technology, all of these things that, are, that have been symbolically associated with men. Um, and the other set takes place, it's in a, a small town, an idyllic small town somewhere in, I don't know, Ohio or someplace, and it's full of trees and pastures and gardens and flowers and the light is warm and of course this is where Julia Roberts flees to get away from her husband and then, and then he tracks her down and he stalks her and he finally gets there and then, okay, so you can see the imagery dividing right down the line very clearly. And what, so, as I say, what amazed me is that it was so sophisticated, that it made use of all these images, put them together in one package, and called it Sleeping with the Enemy. Hmm. So, yeah, if I were to choose one thing, that probably would be it. I don't know where... But there were many others. I mean, there was one movie called, um, what was it called? Now, the Long Walk Home. And that was about the, the early civil rights movement. And you, you're set in a small southern town, and um, at first uh, there's this woman who uh, doesn't really know what her maid wants to go on strike, um, at, join the boycott, the Birmingham bus boycott. Anyway, eventually she gets together with a whole lot of other women, and they they um, uh, they drive their maids, who are all black. Uh, to the uh, boycott and they, they're they part of the movement and at the end of the movie all the women are surrounding, these white women are surrounding the black women in a very protective way. But meanwhile, of course, the men are all, you know, racists and Ku Kluxers and what have you. And so the implication is, never mind what history was, the implication is that women are, you know, sensitive to people's needs, they're not racist, they're caring and sharing and loving and nurturing and all these good things, and the men are all evil. You know, it came out in movie after movie, but that's, these are just two examples that, that I remember. No, that's, that, that, thank you for those. You opened this particular book, Spreading Misandry, uh, Misandry, with a quote from uh, David Thomas, who wrote a book, Not Guilty, The Case in Defense of Men, it was published in 1993. The quote was, Western society is obsessed with women to the point of mass neuroses. Trouble is, people are so busy looking at the, me the men on the top of the heap that no one notices them when they fall. Mm -hmm. So the question there is, to what extent do you think people see this kind of mockery of men or this kind of sometimes even hatred of men as a necessary way to balance the perception that men, in the real world anyway, are still at the top of the heap? Well, uh, first of all, whenever I talk about this, this topic, <clears throat> and I don't talk about this with friends or family, um, I don't, I can't. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I, I value my, my relationships. I'm not interested in getting into conflict about this. But when I do, the subject, it, you know, it invariably comes down to, but men have all the power, and you have all the Donald Trumps and the Rockefellers, and, you know, what are you complaining about? Mm -hmm. So what they do is they, um, men are, are identified as, I guess what, anthropologists, or not anthropologists, but uh, biologists would call alpha males, okay? So what happens in societies of primates where you have alpha males? It means that there are a few at the top who get all the goodies, um, and they have higher status than the females, but at the bottom you have the masses of males who have nothing whatsoever. They are just, they're the leftovers. If they can get a little food by, you know, going up to a, a lower female, then that's fine, but otherwise they're just nothing. So, uh, you know, I think that we've got to start thinking uh, that the men in our society are not, in fact, all, and alpha males, by definition, of course, are the elite. They're at the very top. And very few. And very few. So uh, now we have a situation in which the plight of ordinary men is, is, is somehow coming to light, only because the, the figures are so dramatic. I mean, you know, between four and five times as many men commit suicide as women. 
the number of women in university is about 60% undergraduates. I mean, so something is happening. People can't help but notice. Um, but even even now, it is slow. It's like you have to you have to you have to argue and argue and argue before you get past this presumption that men are all alpha males. You really have to work hard. And I think that perception is at the root of a lot of the issues you touch on in all of your books. Although so. I would, say, but when people say that, when people make that comment that, well, it's only fair now that uh, you know that women get the 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 prizes. But of course, the problem, there's a moral problem with that, and that is that two wrongs don't make a right. Mm -hmm. If it was wrong for a few men to get all the prizes, why is it somehow right for women to get them? I mean, it doesn't make sense morally. And quite frankly, my, the driving force in my own work, I, can, I mean, I never asked Catherine this, but my own, the driving force for me is not academic, it's moral. For me, this is a moral problem. It's not psychological, it's not... Uh, uh, but, it's not even legal primarily, although that's involved. But it's moral. It's a moral problem. But let's get into the legal, because I think the moral is a good is a good segue, because the moral is, is obviously at the core of all of this. It's certainly the core. Well, it is, except of that, of course, as you find out very quickly, the law is not necessarily moral. No. I mean, there's, it's, it ideally but I is. About, but it, I want to ask you about moral assumptions that might underpin okay. it. And there's a couple of notions that I think you, you touch on. For example, the theory of collective guilt, the theory of the, right. the conspiracy theory of right. history. I, I'm interested. I guess in a way, those are those are moral biases that are that are under yeah. that are, provide a, a grounding to some of these these unfair legal biases in right. turn. Um, how do those those two and other biases uh, sort of cause, um, uh, in a way, sometimes feminism to to create a society in which in which the legal system is uh is doesn't always treat men and women well that's same. because that's how you legitimate unequal treatment although the unequal treatment is always couched in terms such as well we're just leveling the playing field this is just temporary but of course who knows what temporary is but that but the but, but the the legitimation for this is that somehow uh men have a coming mm -hmm. so revenge is okay that's a moral problem. Since when is revenge okay? Um, the notion of collective guilt. Now, you know, collective guilt has a long history. We have, um, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, being Jewish, I'm aware of Jewish history and the notion that Jews were always held collectively guilty for what their ancestors might or might not have done in the time of Jesus. So this has a long history. And in fact, the subtitle of that book, of our first book, The Teaching of Contempt, for men, well, the teaching of contempt was a, was an expression that Jules Isaac used. He was asked by the Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council, uh, to to observe the Vatican Council in connection with what the Council might do to create closer ties with Jews. Mm -hmm. So he wrote this book called The Teaching of Contempt, and he said, "Look, you know, if you want to if you want to improve ties with Jews, then you have to take responsibility for." you know, 2,000 years of teaching contempt for this particular group of people. Well, I have to jump in there and ask you, because if we're, if we're with, with, with those sorts of situations uh, with respect to anti-Semitism, if we're so sensitive to the idea of how wrong collective guilt is when it comes to, to races or cultures or religions, why is it we don't get it that that, that that kind of mentality really is at play in so much of the legal bias when it comes to gender? I don't know. We're just not quite there yet perhaps? I, I just, I don't know. To me it is, it is as simple as the golden rule, do unto others, you know, or in the other formulation, do not do unto others what you would not have them do unto you. It, it's very simple. This is a universal, this is, if there's anything universal in culture, it is some variation of that rule. You cannot have a society in which people treat each other with brutality without any kind of moral Sanctions. Yeah, uh, it's the very it's the principle of every social order. So why this idea does not 